there are indelible moments in our life, turning points, forks in the road, where life was headed in one direction and then we have this window, this insight, this opportunity and it shifts. We have these moments, these memories where we experience the richest laughter and joy. We have these moments of deep grief and sadness where life was one way and then it shifts in another direction. The kind of images that are permanently painted in the hallways of our minds that we visit as often as we need to or would like to. These moments that redirect, change trajectory, pivot, and move us in a new direction. Can you see them? I mean, if you and I were to sit across the table from one another, could we walk through these hallways, these memories, and these moments, beginning to know a little bit more about each other's story today in this passage that we're going to consider, this story in Scripture we see this insight, this window into an indelible moment for Peter and the 12 as they are with Jesus in the closing moments before we enter into the things that we celebrate next weekend. My name is Will Rambo. I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard in Tupelo. We're delighted that you're joining us, whether you're here in the room with us on Coley Road or if you're joining us online, however and wherever, that you have made time to be with us today is an honor, and we're so thankful to have you. We are continuing in our series called Resilient, where we are looking at the stories as we approach Easter, but we're looking at them through the eyes of the disciple Peter. And so today, we are going to be in the fourth gospel, John chapter 13. So if you have a Bible with you or a device that you read from, we'll be in John 13. John's the fourth of the gospels, about 85% of the way through your Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible with you and you want to read along and you're here with us on Coley Road, then you, are, you can raise your hand right where you're seated. You'll see some of our greeters are moving around the room. They'd love to bring you a Bible. Page 647 on the screen would get you to John 13. You can use it during the service. You can leave it in a chair when you're done. But if you don't own a Bible that you can read and understand, uh, we would like to give it to you, our free gift to you. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. That By reading it, we understand more the truth of who God is. And in view of God, we have a better understanding of the truth of who we're called to be. And this Bible would help you on that journey. We want you to take it today. John 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 17. John 13, we're going to read 1 through 17. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given him authority over everything, that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. This is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. So when John opens this passage, he brings our attention to it in a very unique way. He uses a phrase that appears other times in his writings. John says, 
Jesus knew, and he uses this phrase, the hour had come. The moment had come. The time was here. The indelible moment, the pivot, the new direction, the new phase. John uses this phrase seven times just in the gospel. And as John uses it, every time it's to more fully reveal Jesus' mission, who he was, and why he came. In every moment, he's trying to draw our attention, the first century readers and 21st century readers, to Jesus' mission and what he came to do. In this instance, when John uses it, John is trying to draw attention to the significance of this meal. They are celebrating what was known as the Passover. And the Passover was a meal uh, each year that Jewish people celebrate to remember the rescue out of Egypt that you can find in Exodus chapter 12. They, they would gather and have a very particular meal, a way of repeating the rhythms of their history to acknowledge God's provision for them. And John wants us to connect what Jesus is doing with what happened then. The rescue from Egypt, the Passover meal, was a remembrance of God's provision specifically to give them freedom. John is wanting us to know that when they're in this upper room, this bar road room on the southwestern side of Jerusalem, Jesus has come to bring freedom as well, just like at the first Passover. But the difference is, Jesus comes to bring freedom in a way that was other than what they anticipated. In the world, in church world today, around the globe, many are, we are celebrating, we are gathering on what is known as Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday in each of the Gospels, like in Mark chapter 11, you could go and look at the history that unfolded a week before Jesus' Uh, death, the week of Jesus' death and resurrection, he had entered the city riding on a colt to shout from the people, Hosanna, which means save us right now. And so those shouts are still ringing in the disciples' ears. Peter and the other 11 that are in this upper room would go, yes, the time is at hand. Jesus is about to fulfill everything we've longed for and waited on. Jesus is about to bring into power everything that we knew he would be. Jesus is about to do what the Messiah came to do. He will obliterate Roman imperialism. He will lead us into a new era of power, of dominion. They imagine Jesus as this conquering military hero riding in on stallion leading the people against the Romans. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. When Peter hoped for a sword, Jesus had other ideas. Jesus' actions in this meal are very intentional. The hour had come. I love the language that John uses. Look at the end of verse 3. Jesus knew that Father had given him authority over everything that he had come from God and would return to God. Jesus knows he has all authority. So, with all authority, Jesus' actions are so intentional. He gets up from the table, and he takes off his robe and puts on the cloak of a servant, wraps a towel around his waist. Jesus is not just a leader who is trying to model servanthood in a moment. He's not just showing up one day going, look, I'm an exec in the office, but I'll also do a few other things. No, Jesus isn't serving in a moment. He is becoming a servant. He is embodying the nature of what it means to be a servant. Jesus is taking on the role. It's not a nice moment. It's not a polite nod. It's the embodiment of what it means to be a servant. This would have messed with the 12 that are gathered there. Rabbis were elevated positions. They were celebrated positions. They were uh, seen with esteem and glory and credit. But Jesus now is taking on this role that is other than that. Jesus is not elevating himself, he is de-elevating himself. But should they have been that surprised? I mean, when we think about the words that Jesus taught, over and over he teaches things like this. In Mark chapter 10, the, just a, about a week before this meal, they had gathered in Jericho, and the disciples had gotten in an argument about whether or not James and John should ask to sit in seats of power when Jesus took over his kingdom. And Jesus gathers the 11 together, and this is what he says in Mark 10. He says, Jesus called them together. He says, you know that rulers in this world lord over their authority, 
Officials flaunt their authority under the, over those under them, but among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. Jesus didn't just put some nice words together in phrases. Jesus is now embodying everything that he taught them. Jesus came to serve them. And these boys, these 12 young men gathered in this room, feeling the the noise and the pressure and the intrigue around Jerusalem all that week, they feeling the emotions of it. They were not ready for what Jesus did in this moment. Seeing Jesus dressed in the simple garb of a servant, the, the same hands they had seen multiply fish and loaves, the same man they had seen walk on water and raise Lazarus from the dead and give a blind man sight, this same man. The same man is now kneeling in front of them. He's kneeling at their feet in the same hands that had carved out ocean valleys and moved up mountaintops, the same hands that had placed every star in the sky, the same hands that had brought miracles before them, now is taking water from the basin. He's moving his fingers in between their toes, cleaning out the dirt, the mire, and the dung. And they just don't know what to do with that. It's uncomfortable. It's countercultural. A man of Jesus' status shouldn't be doing something like that. But can't you see them? Their puzzled looks, their discomfort. Can't you see them looking down at their feet as Jesus meets their gaze, filled with love and compassion? Just in the moment when they desired something different, Jesus gave them what they needed. When a hero with sword and stallion was desired, Jesus instead offers them a humble servant with a towel and a basin. It is a curious image. For all the other practices of, the, of Jesus that the church naturally incorporates today, foot washing is not common among them because it's still uncomfortable. Peter's reaction when this time has come, when the hour was at hand, Peter's reaction is clear. It's the one that we get written down for us. We don't know what the other 11 said, if they said anything at all, but we do get Peter's words. Maybe Peter was just uncomfortable with the broken nature of this cultural norm. Maybe Peter is just uncomfortable with that reality, but there are some other things at hand as well. I believe that Peter is sensing a moment of shame. You see, the way that this table would have been set up, the way they would have shared this meal, they would have gathered around a three-sided table shaped like a U known as a triclinium table like this, often lounging with your left elbow on the ground and your feet pushed away from the table. And look, there's a lot of details I can't go into right now, but I will tell you there are context clues that tell us very intentionally where Peter was sitting. Peter was sitting in a seat. He had ended up in a seat where he should have been the one who had washed their feet. He was in the servant's chair. Peter should have gotten up at the beginning of the meal. It was first century custom and culture. Whoever sat in the servant's chair should have gotten up at the beginning of the meal because everybody was lounging and getting comfortable. And in a day and age where they walked either with no shoes or open-toed shoes, Peter should have been the one to offer this cleansing to each of his peers. But, but Peter didn't. Maybe some of Peter's defiance of going, look, you, you can't do that, is because he knows he should have done it all along. But when they get in their seats, there's something about Peter in this moment. Peter looks around at the other 11 and he goes, why am I the one that has to wash feet? Why am I the one that has to be the servant? Don't they know who I am? Have they not heard what Jesus said? I'm the rock on which he's going to build this church. Don't don't some of these guys know I'm one of the three that got to go up and see Jesus miraculously 
transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration. Don't they know? Don't they know I walked on water? Peter feels this resistance. His pride and his ego elevates to the top in a room full of men who are jostling for position and what they still are convinced will be an empire of power. Peter is uncomfortable with that reality. He looks at his peers and he broods. He is resistant to do what he should. Peter is locked up in a prison of his own self-importance. Ever felt that way? Ever felt these twinges of entitlement? Ever felt these moments of going, why does that always work out for them and it never works out for me? Peter feels all of that. Jesus. Jesus hears Peter's proclamations, his exclamations. No, no, no. Don't wash my feet. You can't wash my feet. But Jesus didn't come to make Peter feel guilty. Jesus comes to set Peter free. Jesus doesn't come to make Peter feel guilty. Jesus has come that Peter would be free. So Jesus washes his feet. Peter resists at first, feeling feeling his heart filled with shame. But the ferocity of Jesus' love overwhelms him. Friends, when is the last time? When's the last time you were overwhelmed by Jesus' love? Have you ever been overwhelmed by the reality of Jesus' love? The ferocity of it. Peter comes to this moment resistant, but Jesus always confronts us. He confronts our pride. He confronts our ego, never with violence, but with the sheer force of his love for us. Jesus meets them in this moment. And the walls of Peter's self-reliance begin to crumble. Friends, are there some of us who this day need the walls of our self-reliance to fall down? We've been doing it on our own. Do we need to receive the power of Jesus' love? Maybe for some of us the time has come, and that time is for us to allow Jesus to love us, to receive the love that he makes available, to make clean the unclean we've been hanging on to, the pattern, the rhythm, the habit that we keep clenching our fists around. Maybe it's time to let go of that, to let Jesus confront our inward enslavement that we might be set free. Jesus washes each of the disciples' feet. And then he goes and he puts the basin back on the, count, on the shelf, wipes his hands with a towel, and then he sits down with the 12, and he goes, do, do you understand what I just did? We get no response because we know the answer. Every time Jesus asks that to the disciples, the answer is n- no, no. I always imagine that in those moments, there's 11 that shake their head and there's one disciple who's brave enough to go, oh yeah, I get it, oh yeah, I get it. They clearly don't. Jesus says, do you understand what I'm doing? He says, look, if I'm your teacher and I'll move from a position of elevation and I'll wash your feet, I need you to wash one another's feet. I need you to take what I've done. I've given you an example. I've given you a model. Imitate what you saw me doing. Jesus is trying to establish the ethic, the character, the fabric of what this community of faith, these followers of Jesus would look like. Not in pristine facilities, distant and disengaged from their cities and communities, but serving, de-elevating this new community of faith that was being formed. That's what Jesus wanted for first century disciples and 21st century disciples. He says, I've given you an example which makes complete sense because the primary way that you and I learn anything is through imitation. If tomorrow on Monday you had to have surgery, do you want to show up and have a doctor who goes, I'm really excited. I've actually never done this surgery, but I've read about it in a textbook and I feel really good about the information I have. And so you'll be my first attempt. I'm sure it'll go well. 
I mean, how fast can we run? We'll find out in that moment, right? We learn by imitation. We learn by doing. How often does someone younger than us or someone who is outside of a realm of expertise come to us and go, could you show me how to? Not just tell me. Could you show me? How-to videos on YouTube are one of the most watched things on that platform because we love visually being able to see how to do something. My grandfather was a butcher, and every summer when baseball would end in the summertime, I'd go work in his grocery store for several weeks in West Point, Mississippi. And I still to this day, when I go to one of the grocery stores in our town, I choose meat based on the things that are his uh, phrases are repeating in my head about how to measure and understand if I'm getting a quality cut. When I slice meat, I, I think about the things he taught me. I hear the phrases. My children, who never worked in that butcher shop, will know how to use those phrases because he instilled it in us. We learn by imitation. I make sweet tea the way my mama did, the way that my grandmother taught her to make it. That's how I make sweet tea. We learn by imitation. I also don't know why so many of my images have to do with food, but maybe it's just because I'm hungry. We learn by imitation. We learn by having the chance to see what we are to become. Images stick in our mind in a way that is different than words. Jesus wants his disciples to imitate him. The way of the kingdom is not about climbing a ladder. The way of the kingdom is foot washing. It is serving. It is moving our pla- ourselves to a place where we are available to offer something to someone else. It's uncomfortable. It can at times feel absurd. But Paul writes that the way of Jesus will always seem like foolishness to the world. And friends, there's a couple of ways in particular. Look, how do we learn to imitate? If the people of Jesus should be different with this willingness to serve at a moment's notice, that there's nothing beneath us because Jesus didn't come to be served but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. How is it that we can learn to serve? Too often we love when Jesus talks about salvation, but we neglect the response to the salvation we receive being service. Look, there's a couple of ways. We are intentionally placing this conversation here so we can talk to to us as a community of faith about what it means to serve and how we can do it. If you were a few minutes late tuning in or getting here to the service today, I encourage you to go back and watch the first five minutes. We talked about Serve Weekend. Turn to your neighbor and say, Serve Weekend. Serve Weekend. We're going to instill it in your brain. Serve Weekend, April 30th, May 1st. We're not gathering for normal Sunday morning worship. We're going to, on Saturday or Sunday, whenever you can find a pocket of time, we are going to serve in our city, and then we're going to gather together at Fair Park on Sunday night, May 1st at 6 p.m. for the worship service. We'll have some other activities around that we'll be telling you more about. But we want, to, we want to remind ourselves and we want to remind our city that we don't exist to sit here on this side of town to gather just to eat donuts and drink coffee. We are here to follow Jesus and the example he set for us. We want to work for the good of our city. We want to work for the good of our city. So we want you to to look at the projects that our our mission partners in our city have, and we want you to come up with things that we would never know about. If you live in one of our outlying communities, we don't want you to drive in from Pontotoc or Fulton to serve. We want you to find a way to serve in your city. We want the orchard to be unequivocally known as a people who want to follow Jesus' example, and we're learning how to serve him. How can you serve that weekend. Can't serve on those two days? You have a prior obligation? No problem. Service opportunities actually exist anytime we want to do it. Mow a yard, rake some leaves, cook a casserole for somebody who needs it. Find a way to serve. Sing to shut-ins. Find a way to serve so that we can follow the example of Jesus. So an image sticks in our mind of what it means to become followers of Jesus. A second way you can serve is you can find a way, if this is your church home, is to find a way to serve when we are together. Friends, it's been the slowest part of our church in bouncing back from the last two and a half years. It's been the slowest place of response. It got very easy for us to be disengaged. We enjoyed having extra time. I totally understand. And yet, to be a part of a community of faith, what we like to say about our church family is that we are a family. 
And to be a part of a family means that if we are a part of it, we take some responsibility. We'd love to help you find a place to serve. If you've never served, if it's been too long, if you want to start from scratch, you can email us, info at theorchard.net. We would love to help you find a place to serve, to give our lives away, to remember what it is like to follow Jesus' example. There's nothing beneath us. We're willing to do whatever it takes. That's what it means to be the people of Jesus. We follow his example. We don't try to elevate ourselves to power. We don't need to be the one who's always in the room making a call. What instead we want to do is be those who take the towel and the basin and we serve. We find someone else that we can lavish the love that we've received Jesus from Jesus. I had a friend who texted me Thursday morning, a good friend that regularly texts when he comes across something that strikes him and he knows it would be an encouragement to me. He sent me this phrase, convenience is virtually sacred in America and it's taking the place of true involvement and heartfelt commitment to do what Jesus has called us to do. Will we be those who seek convenience or those who seek commitments that shape us and form us more into the image of Jesus? This this carving that you see uh, on the table that we set up is a piece that's made out of one solid piece of wood, olive wood tree, made from uh, an olive wood tree that uh, was in Bethlehem. I bought it on one of my trips over. And I keep it in my office in view because it reminds me that my role as, as, as a part of this community of faith is simply to become more like this, slowly but surely, that each of us would find the ways that we join Jesus in the activity. I am so prone, I am so tempted to want to pursue elevation and power, but the way of Jesus is de-elevation and humility. I keep it there because I need a visual reminder of what it means to shepherd well, to follow Jesus even in the places I don't really want to go. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, hey, if there was a book I needed to read, what book should I read? And the book I bought the most copies outside the Bible, I have to say that as a preacher, outside the Bible. The most common book I've bought and given away to others. It is not a great title, but it is an incredible book. It's called The Master Plan of Evangelism. It's written by a man named Robert Coleman, who takes the way of Jesus and shows how to multiply it into our lives. And this is one of the things that Coleman writes. He says, yes, we know mere knowledge is not enough. There comes a time for action. To disregard this privilege can nullify all that has been acquired in the process of learning. Indeed, knowledge applied to living can become a stumbling stone to further truth. There comes a time for action. Friends, the hour is upon us. The question for us today is, what hour is it? What is today the moment, the indelible moment for in your life? Is today a time where you, you kind of collapse under the weight of your own self-reliance and self-importance? Is the weight of what you're wrestling with more than you can bear? And so do you just fall, fall on your face and allow Jesus to remind you how loved you are, that what we will walk through and celebrate in the next week are the single most important historical events if they be true, would we receive that? Do you need to be reminded today? Do you need to be overwhelmed by how he loves you? It's today, a moment, the time has come where you invite someone to speak that into your life. Maybe for some of us, we are aware of how loved we are and the time for us, the hour that is upon us is that it's time for us to step up, to follow the example that's been set, to take up our own towel and basin, to recognize that the same hands that shaped the earth into being would soon be pierced on our behalf. That he comes to cleanse us and to set us free. And we want to follow his example. Maybe now is the time for action. 
There's one who comes to set you and I free, to rescue us from the enslavements of our own heart. Jesus has modeled a way for us. May, for those of us gathered and those of us tuning in today, may this day be an indelible moment, a fork in the road, a shift in phasings, phases, where you and I, where we together follow the way of Jesus and become a little bit more the people he's called, crafted, and created us to be. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how your word strikes us. I thank you that your word makes us uncomfortable. Jesus, we're more, um, we're more comfortable with the ways of power. Jesus, if you came to pursue power, if you came to elevate from on high, if you came to sit at the places that we Im- imagine and associate with earthly power, we would have understood it more, but it would have just led us into the deeper places of our own enslavement. So, Lord, we want to be reminded this day that we can't do it on our own. We're not the purveyors of what is right and good. We're not the purveyors of vision and authority. We are simply those who need to receive the love that you give us. Jesus, having been loved well by you, may we be those who look at those around us and think there's just nothing beneath us. Maybe we'd be willing to pick up a towel and a basin. May we find the places you're inviting us to serve, to give our lives away, that in it we would find that we are not losing, we are actually gaining, becoming more, the very people that you want us to be. There's a reason, Lord, when we find perfect rhythm with our gifts and passions and the world's great need that we feel most alive. May you make that moment the intersection between who you've called us to be and what the world needs us to become. May you make that moment so intoxicating that we can't avoid it, that we long for more of you to fill up the likes of us. That's our prayer this morning, together. To you, our Father, in the name of Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.